Good morning and welcome to the session on digital learning in the wake of COVID-19, what teachers need. I am Monique Chisholm and I am the Undersecretary for Education at the Smithsonian. Here at the Smithsonian, we are committed to working with educators across the nation to help meet student needs, to help students explore their curiosities, but then also to help teachers and educators across the nation improve student outcomes. So I could not be more thrilled to be the moderator of today's session. We have a wonderful panel um, assembled for you. We have uh, Taylor Hawks who is joining us. She's a teacher at, um, at science at a DC public school. She joined the Smithsonian last summer for an extra externship experience. We also have Ellen Rogers, who is an IB coordinator for Fairfax County Public Schools. And she has worked with Smithsonian educators for over five years, so has a lot of wonderful things to share. And then last but certainly not least, we also have Maggie Benson, who is a Smithsonian museum educator at the National Museum of Natural Science. Nat Natural History, I'm so sorry. Natural Science, right? Natural Science. <laughs> Um, and Maggie is going to share her perspective on the use of digital resources in K-12 education. But I want to give each of the panelists just a moment to say hello and welcome. And so why don't we go ahead and start with Maggie. Hello, thank you so much, Monique. Uh, and thank you for having me. I'm Maggie Benson. I'm at um, one of our science museums, the National Museum of Natural History. And I am really honored to be on this panel and to represent the amazing work of the education department at our museum. And Taylor, why don't you give us a brief welcome? Thank you. Um, definitely excited to be here to share some of my point of view as an educator at Coolidge High School for DC Public Schools. Um, I'm currently a health and science teacher and I've been navigating you know, digitally and then in person. So I think that a lot of the information that I wanna share would definitely benefit this panel. Great, and Ellen. Hi, I'm Ellen Rogers. I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, I am the IB coordinator at Belvedere Elementary School. And I think a big part of what I've gotten out of all of this is just the connections that I've made with um, teachers and educators from the Smithsonian. So I'm thrilled that we're all on the panel together today. Great. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to our panelists. Each panelist will give a short presentation and talk a little bit about the work they do um, the, the things that they have identified as needs over the last two years, and uh, this, this question about the incorporation of digital strategies into instructional practices, um, each one will touch on that. So we're going to start off with Maggie Benson, who will talk to us a little bit about the work that she does. Maggie? Thank you so much, Monique. And Hello, Maggie Benson, and I am really happy to be here. Um, and so I am going to be talking about digital learning and at the National Museum of Natural History as the distance learning manager, um, which I was before the pandemic. Next slide. Just to begin, just a little bit of context about our um, education um, programs at the Natural History Museum. We are dedicated to inspiring all ages to better understand their natural world and their place in it, and really to connect to it through our exhibitions, our programs, and our online resources, which includes Curious, our education space for students and the public located in the museum. Next slide. Now, we did have digital learning, um, robust digital learning before COVID-19. We had a web, we have a website, and that um, website has over 400 active pages of education content that represents natural history science. And the resources that are present on this website are really informed by um, teacher focus groups, teacher surveys, web data, and collaborations and partnerships um, with all sorts of organizations, but including schools, especially DC public schools. And so um, we have kind of this rich history of working um, 
to deliver what teachers um, want and need and working with them to be able to create experiences. One of the experiences that we had before the COVID-19 pandemic that was really instrumental in helping us transition during the pandemic was Smithsonian Science How. This is a distance learning program um, that I launched um, with my colleagues in 2014, and it puts um, scientists inside classrooms through live, live um, webinar technology, usually pre-pandemic with objects and um, interactions. Uh, next slide. And I really wanted to draw this out because um, we know because of this program that virtual field trips, live webinars are truly an effective learning resource. Um, this slide right here represents a tiny snapshot from a 2019 study that we did with one uh, with DC Public School elementary students, um, which was really lovely. And uh, one of the evaluation instruments was the draw scientist assessment. And what we found from this study was that um, live digital programs, Smithsonian and science how specifically does positively influence students attitudes and interests in science and it does spark their in increase and spark their interest in science careers which we believe is kind of a predecessor to really starting that science identity and that ownership of their science experiences and so we were really gearing up to gather more data on this study because we were really encouraged and next slide and then the pandemic happened um this is actually a shot of the day the pandemic closed and we had it all set up for a digital program with students and so we pivoted um next slide and pivoting meant that we had to serve these teachers and their students in new ways but also activate an entire staff of people that um how to practice inside museum spaces. And so we came out of the gate with virtual tours and um, self-guided, they were very popular. We kind of increased um, the content by creating short videos that experts gave of our museum spaces these narrated virtual tours. And right now we're working on creating activities that um, go with our virtual tours if you can't physically come to the museum. Next slide. But really where a lot of the energy and effort went to was webinars. And this is really because we had that foundation of Smithsonian Science How. And from March to June, um, we really focused on getting all of our team members in education geared up to be able to shift their practice to the digital space. And that was amazing. And the work that my colleagues did was truly remarkable. They did about 70 live webinar programs, putting scientists inside classrooms between March and June of 2020. And um, what was interesting is when we step back and looked at all of the data collectively, whether it was adult programs or programs for families with very young kids, the um, highest, the audience that was coming in the greatest numbers and with greatest frequency were elementary and middle school students. Um, and this really kind of supported a hunch that we had, in part informed by a program that you see on this kind of um, uh, spoke here, Teacher Tuesday, where we did these webinars with teachers and um, we shared with them what resources we had, but in return, they were sharing with us what they needed, what challenges they had. And next slide, what we learned from our metrics, our experience in these kind of teacher interactions was that the area of greatest need and potential impact that we could make was with elementary and middle school students. They were dying for experiences as formal education was really in flux. And when there was instruction, it was really heavily focused on math and science. And they were looking for these science experiences that were fun, engaging, got them out of their kind of virtual spaces. Next slide. And what we really um, saw in our evaluations, our survey and feedback um, was that these programs that we were offering them that connected our scientists to these classrooms were a little bit different and attributed to these kind of positive different experiences was how interactive they were. The fact that they got to meet real scientists and it was relevant in current research that they were sharing and really being able to be represented in that program, being able to hear their name called out and being able to kind of really be a part of it with a large group of um, students. Next slide. So after June, we had to kind of set back 70 programs in like 
three months was a lot. So we kind of shifted for the summer to try a different model, which kind of gave us a chance to um, shift a little bit of our practice to integrate more um, movement activities, drawing activities, crafts, things that were a little bit different for our audiences. And next slide. That got us to where we are now in our current digital strategy. And we were able to kind of um, get into the groove of virtual learning. So was formal education. And so we kind of came back to this model um, that we actually started launching with support um, from a Smithsonian grant for our Smithsonian Science How program just before the pandemic closed, which was this idea of a transmedia experience where we kind of tell a similar story across different mediums. And with all of the lessons that we learned from the pandemic, we are creating these content areas. We call them bundles. We totally need a new title. But what it is, is it's grouping live experiences with our educators, with our scientists, with wraparound asynchronous resources. And we find that this is a really important thing to do because it's meeting teachers' needs, it's meeting students' needs, it's a one-stop shop to find everything. And we're providing multiple means of engagement and representation of our content. So there's multiple entry points for students. And next slide. And really, there's kind of different goals depending on what kind of tool or platform we're using. Our school programs are really heavily focused on building that content knowledge through one-on-one -on -one, um, classes with our Smithsonian educators. Whereas the Smithsonian Science How webinars are really about representing diversity in science and increasing that interest and attitude and science identity of students. And then the asynchronous di digital resources are really providing different entry points to those kind of science content areas and um, meeting scientists through scientist spotlight videos or doing an activity to extend that experience. All of these are free. Now I'm just going to very quickly run through some of those bundle components that we call them and share some lessons learned. So next slide. So if you go to our website, you'll actually find these bundles listed as school programs. And, um, and here's an example of one of them about reef biodiversity. Next slide. And really the foundational element of all these are our digital school programs. The most incredible thing of this pandemic was the onboarding of digital programs. We had to make a really strategic decision um, to cut back the number of live webinars we were doing that were working, but to refocus our energy and capacity and resources to creating these one-on-one -on -one experiences for classrooms. Teachers needed those. And that was a huge um, success led by my colleague, Nicole Webster and her team. And these numbers are a little bit outdated, but since September, 2021, um, when before that we had zero digital school programs in this fashion, um, we've completed nearly 600 programs and engaged nearly 20,000 students um, in these programs. And next slide. And we have them um, for different grade bands, um, K through 12. And we are working on a pre-K program right now. It's not quite ready. But the content of these is informed by what we know from teacher focus groups, teacher needs, teacher requests. But also one of the most influential is DC public schools in a direct relationship that my colleague Nicole has with DC public schools. Three of these programs, Animal Adaptations, Rocks and Minerals, and Urban Habitats, are actually part of the DC Cornerstone curriculum. And pre-pandemic, these were really kind of co-designed with DC pandemic area, not as much, but we're hoping to get back into that space to make sure that we have what they need. Next slide. So I already spoke about the live webinars. This is putting the scientists inside the classrooms for this particular series, Smithsonian Science How. Um, we do this at this point in the pandemic about monthly, and we have over 100 published archives on our website. Next slide. And this is to demonstrate, this slide here, to demonstrate that we are continuing to do research and evaluation even during the pandemic. And we have this wonderful tool that's being piloted with the support of NSF and a partner at COSI in research and one of my colleagues, Colleen Popson, where we are collecting qualitative and quantitative data to be from teachers to be able to learn about their experiences. And so far what we are seeing is that these digital school programs are effectively in engaging students and building their interests and content knowledge. And so we feel um, really strongly that this is a really wonderful path forward um, to continue to invest in. Next slide. 
Um, our website also has video content. Um, I encourage you to go explore it. Next slide. We have activities that um, pull on our collections, um, our authentic research, and really aim to allow students to practice some of the same skills scientists have, like making observations and finding patterns and asking questions. Next slide. Um, we've invested a lot in literacy resources, knowing that students um, may not have a science requirement, but they have a literacy resource. And how do you get science into that? And so we um, have leveled readers right now for one of our elementary, early elementary programs um, that we just heard from DC public um, school teachers during a PD were, would be very helpful to have more of, which was encouraging. Next slide. Um, I mentioned we have featured collections. We have featured collections that we integrate within the collections browser on our website, but also in Learning Lab. And next slide. Um, I, here, I just kind of want to look to the future. So this is our bundle strategy. We're currently right now evaluating the strategy, actively seeking seeking feedback from teachers who are using it to find out how we can um, address kind of our strategy to best meet their needs. And looking forward from my personal perspective, not necessarily representing all of the museum, I think we really have an opportunity here for leadership within um, this space so that we can really support teachers' needs um, to be able to adjust what we're offering them to give them what they need now and what their learners need and keeping their learners kind of at the center of that experience. But also we have an opportunity for um, to advance equity and to be able to design and create opportunities and resources aimed at advancing science equity um, and access. That's a huge part of it in creating experiences, resources that have multiple entry points and really truly consider the different ability, skills, and knowledge of, um, of our learners. And uh, next slide. And really kind of the Final lessons learned that I really wanted to summarize with is our big takeaways at the Natural History Museum is that teachers want digital programming and experiences beyond the pandemic and that digital education is really going to continue to be the norm. Um, we also know that we have to give learners choice in how they experience our content and they have to see themselves um, in terms of diversity, gender and ages um, to be able to feel like they can connect with that content and also have their voice and their ideas represented in that programming. Learners need options for format and delivery to meet their different learning styles. I just mentioned that with accessibility. Uh, we also know that digital school programs and webinars are definitely effective learning resources. I've mentioned that a couple of times. And finally, I really think that um, informal education and science centers like the Smithsonian and all of our units really should continue to invest in this space and create digital experiences and resources that um, reflect our authentic place um, for K-12, which is the authentic research, experience, collections, experts, and content. Um, final, I think I have one more final slide. And so thank you very much for giving me your time and um, allowing me to be part of this wonderful panel. It's teachers like Taylor and Ellen who have helped us along the way and we truly value all of the, um, all of the information and what they have experiences that they share with us to try to help them in the classroom with their students. So I'm going to um, pass it off to Taylor. All right, hello everyone. Yes. Um, speaking to you uh, from the perspective as an educator, health and science academy teacher um, at Coolidge High School. Next slide. Um, just some things about what I do. I particularly prepare students for college and career readiness with the Project Lead the Way Biomedical Science Program at Coolidge. And it's with my facilitation that I lead students through a discovery of health professional skills and biomedical science topics. We explore real world problems and navigate creating ideas and solutions for the problems. So honestly, it's my goal to prepare students um, with a 2022 readiness. And this is with access to different learning mediums and um, deepen their educational exposure in order to better support uh, diverse learners in my courses. 
so some of the topics that you'll notice being mentioned is navigating digital resources and science, um, some of the existing educational resources that I use um, and some of the things that I've um, discovered through using them, and then connecting resources to educational use purposefully. Uh, next slide. So during distance learning, this is uh, pretty much the topic <laughs> for um, why we started using more digital resources. And it's uh, distance learning that literally made me see transforming um, hands-on science to represent it digitally is um, a skill in itself as mm -hmm. an educator because we have to learn how to use uh, the computer or the iPad. We also have to learn the software, like how to use the software and navigate it. And then being able to share that information with our students to help them um, use this as a digital hands-on science activity is um, the, the new goal. So there's definitely a need for educators to get these skills and get exposure ourselves through whether um, a professional development or outside um, learning. So what I did actually um, was participate in an externship with uh, the Smithsonian digitization team. And they explained what 3D models are they also um, touched on augmented reality. And these are a lot of platforms that could help um, learning and science become more efficient for our students, especially students who may not speak English um, as their first language or students who have learning disabilities. And my classroom um, does encompass a lot of different learners um, like that. So while I worked with um, the digitization team, I was able to uh, learn a little bit more about the learning design and implementation process. And this is something that um, teachers have to be mindful of when we're using or outsourcing uh, materials for our classes. Um, so digital resources are things that we have to now kind of incorporate as um, a digital hands-on activity that can extend and deepen their understanding of, the, pro of uh, the scientific process or the concept or whatever skill they're learning. So um, I definitely uh, got an understanding of how to make connections between the product um, or that digital resource and my curriculum. And that's probably um, a really big gap that I've noticed teachers want to um, employ in their classrooms, but the need for support needs to also match that requirement. So now we are in a new school year, we're back in person and we're learning. And what do our students want? <laughs> At my school particularly, we sent out surveys and a lot of students asked to um, go back to traditional 3D models and paper. Um, now with my curriculum, it doesn't really support 3D um, uh, paper models and a lot of paper uh, worksheets because the book is online and we've already been navigating some of these 3D models and augmented reality, looking at um, the skeletal system or human body systems like the heart and how they navigate um, those. So what I uh, kind of am learning is that maybe students didn't like the struggle of trying to learn how to use these uh, resources on a laptop. And then we, we honestly had to teach them how to use these resources on a laptop from a laptop. It wasn't even in person. So if um, we address that there is a need for students and teachers to um, become more tech savvy, as well as there's a need to just explore um, and have access to working laptops and strong Wi-Fi uh, to meet that equity need for schools. That would definitely help um, my 3D models in my classroom and students being a part of that process. Next slide, please. So navigating these digital resources, the big takeaways. Um, 
it really increases accessibility to science phenomena. Uh, just watching a video of the Northern Lights is something that we can bring to our students instead of having to physically transport them. And now with um, field trips, you know, virtual field trips um, and virtual labs, we're able to um, increase that accessibility of science to our students inside the classroom or wherever we are teaching them if it's distance learning. Another thing, it helps facilitate hands-on learning while distance learning um, because um, a lot of teachers know there are many uh, virtual labs uh, that existed before the pandemic and we were using them, but we were using them with, um, you know, with a virtual lab, it's easy because we don't have to worry about materials breaking or do we have enough materials? Um, did we order the supplies in time? Did we get the, the budget uh, squared away? So there's a lot of little parts that uh, digital resources help with um, educators to keep us um, engaged in uh, providing these consistent opportunities for students to get hands-on learning. And then it also allows students to grapple with uh, higher order questions because we're bringing the phenomena to them. We're having them analyze and evaluate things that um, are represented to them and have direct uh, correlation to our curriculum. Then the last thing is it's easy to modify. Going to Google and searching up um, a virtual lab and then creating questions for it or, or uh, adding a reading to it is something that uh, teachers definitely want to see a part of their everyday uh, class routine. Next slide, please. So some of the existing educational resources, um, Smithsonian has a lot. I've been using Smithsonian for um, throughout the eight years that I've been teaching, whether it's walkthroughs of a forest or learning about corals, um, they do a really good job of getting students to interact with science. Um, then there are things like explore learning that I have my students do, which are just um, other virtual labs um, that they can participate in. So the, the overall goal is it's easy to navigate. We don't have to prepare and set up solutions. We don't have to um, gather a bunch of materials and worry about teaching uh, students how to hold them and, and properly do these things with fear. <laughs> so it kind of gives them uh, at least the first step of modeling um, mm -hmm. what is the correct skill and then we can get students with these um, hands-on uh, beakers and things so that they have more confidence. Um, another thing, um, with some educational resources, uh, they may not have tasks or questions that are specific to our curriculum. So that may be a limitation for teachers. Um, but as I said before, if there is something then it can be modified, it can be altered or tailored for our class. And then um, another thing is that a lot of these models or digital resources can be used in multiple grade levels or multiple um, subjects because of their uh, connection um, between the subjects. So if our uh, digital resources identify already how they connect to um, our curriculum, it really does save us some time because we have, what, 80 minutes or 45 minutes to plan, depending on which school you're at. So um, these are just things that we as educators want to um, keep in mind. Next slide. Okay, so again, um, digital resource limitations. So we, we have existing resources, we identify some of their problems, maybe there's only one reading level offered. Um, if you're learning about corals, normally you, you would imagine you're learning about cor corals in middle school, but as an ecosystem, you would learn about them in high school. So identifying the fact that educators need, you know, a little more in depth for ecosystem corals than just understanding corals in middle school. Um, so sometimes, there may be very basic questions, but 
addressing the need for more critical thinking as we get to higher level um, subjects or biology or maybe even chemistry, understanding what they're made of, um, uh, that would be great to be addressed. Then the lack of training, not just for educators, but getting educators to train our students <laughs> to use um, a laptop is a skill. So getting us to be comfortable with um, the laptops or any type of tech that we're using. And then addressing that students do have difficulty um, navigating uh, computers and laptops and other Apple <laughs> uh, resources if you have them in your school. Next slide. Okay, so with all that being said, we wanna take it back to connecting to our educational curriculum. Supporting professionals is key, especially when we're using digital resources. So what do we need? We need teacher input and we need to be um, knowledgeable of using the learning design process um, purposefully. So with teacher input, we know, well, what do teachers have to do? Um, we have to teach content, we have to teach content based on grade level, and we have to also make sure it's connected to specific areas of our courses, because some teachers teach multiple courses like that. Next slide, please. So with teacher input, we're essentially supporting our student experiences. Teachers are gonna be able to help you um, identify ways to make navigation easy. We're gonna say we need tutorials, we need directions. That would make it easier if a student could watch a um, video on that, as well as any background information given on that topic. And then easy to locate buttons or features and um, just tasks with embedded in the software that allows students to engage, not just um, observing, but maybe going through other skills with that um, resource. And, Next and slide, Taylor, please. we're gonna go ahead and um, come back to some of these issues in our open discussion. Um, you've you. presented so much rich information. I'm gonna go ahead and, and invite Ellen in and then we'll jump back into some of these um, really valuable points that you're sharing with us. Um, next slide, next slide, please. Um, so I'm Ellen Rogers, as I said before at the top, and I'm the IB coordinator at Belvedere Elementary School. It's a Title I public school in Fairfax County. It is the second, it, we just became, well, we have been, but our second school just joined us as the second PYP school. Um, we have plenty of IB middle school and high schools, but um, there's only two elementary IB schools. Um, I'm also on Twitter and I wanna be talking about Twitter quite a bit because it actually plays a huge role in um, when we talk about the pandemic. But can you go to the next slide, please? Um, Belvedere is in Fairfax County, as I said, it serves students in pre-K through fifth grade. Um, and I get the pleasure of working with all of those grades. Um, at an IB school, an elementary school, um, what's been tasked by the International Baccalaureate is this idea of creating units that follow six transdisciplinary themes. And in that they're asking the teachers to write curriculum that blends all the subject areas and creates learning experiences that would help the students understand concepts throughout their day. So the ideas of causation or change, not just in science, but what does that look like in mathematics, in language arts, in art, music, PE, et cetera. So it's quite a bit of a task. So the teachers kind of have to take apart um, the curriculum that the state has given them and put it back together in these six units. Um, and so it certainly leads to lots of meetings where we're looking for materials. And that kind of brings me to why I was asked to come today. Um, so next slide, please. Um, one of the first times I had real experience of digging deep into um, the Smithsonian Learning Lab was um, when I attended a summer institute for teachers hosted by Washington International School. Um, and there they kind of fused together museum resources and educators and Project um, Harvard School of Education Project Zero ideas. And it blew my mind to see all of this together and could see how 
using rich museum resources could also really help kids practice these thinking routines that really push students into deeper thinking. And two of the people that happened to be in my group were uh, Tess Porter and Ashley Naranjo, who ended up being people that I connected with for much longer. So they both worked at the um, Smithsonian Learning Lab. And I told them I was a little intimidated in using it. And they said, Ellen, it's really not that bad. We'll show you how to use it. Um, and so I was hooked immediately. Once I realized that there were all these digital resources that I could create into collections that I could make for my students, I was thrilled. Um, and so I moved into my fourth grade year really being excited about um, what could I provide for my students. So um, my students also really liked that they got to control what it looked like. So they could zoom in, they could read the details, they didn't have to rely on me or an adult to um, kind of direct them. And I think that part of was really liberating for the students. And it's what I really enjoyed most when I initially started working with the Smithsonian Learning Lab materials. And I did tweet it quite a bit about it because I was so excited about it. And that actually led to an opportunity that I got. So next slide, please. Um, in my connections with Jim Reese, who runs the Washington International School um, Summer Institute for Teachers, he connected several of us into a museum project um, through the Smithsonian Learning Lab. Um, and it was, it was funded through Longview Foundation. And what they asked us to do is create collections that people could use um, that were focused on thinking routines and museum resources and what we were actually teaching with our students. And so I, it was amazing because I actually got to meet these educators and talk to them. Um, and they were able to kind of, if I came to them, for instance, in, when I met with um, the educators from the Smithsonian Zoo, I said, well, I'm working on this idea of conservation. And they said, oh, well, we have this perfect idea. You should do this. And I didn't even know that like the Northern Trail had this whole perfect part about the success story of conservation. So it was a really great learning process for me, but also wonderful for me because I also made really great connections with museum educators. And some of them are obviously on view again here. And so it became a place of, I didn't realize, and maybe it was just being naive that museum educators would curate things just for your school, for your students. Um, and that to me was mind blowing, obviously coming from a very specific school that really is trying to do an interconnected experience. It's a little more specific than just doing one specific science thing. I really need something that ties maybe science and math together and being able to email with um, any of the educators and being able to get their feedback has been so helpful. So next slide, please. So then I became the IB coordinator at my school, which means I definitely exploited all of the connections that I made with the Smithsonian educators and really moved into using um, museum resources during my planning times with teachers where we wrote our units. So I really started exposing this idea of like, how could we might use this collection and this thinking routine to really push students thinking and really deepen and enrich their experience through the unit. Um, and so the teachers really started to feel more confident, mostly because I was kind of forcing them to do it. But just this idea of, I felt like a little bit, it felt a little bit like the I was the ambassador between these educator, these educators at the museum are available. I promise you, they are they're <laughs> willing to work with us if we just reach out. And so that was kind of the bridge I provided. Next slide, please. And then I feel like we've all talked about it, but um, when the pandemic hit, my job changed dramatically because <laughs> there was this time where I was blending all of this wonder curric wonderful curriculum together with teachers, and we literally couldn't be together, and we couldn't be with the kids, and so. I'm one of those people that didn't know what else to do other than I decided to make collections for my community, my school community every day. So I would make a collection every day. I would post about it. If you, if you look for me on Twitter, there are, I think, 40 days of me sharing a collection that I had created that encouraged students to look and learn a little bit about some aspect and to engage with Project Zero Ideas with their families. So that was an avenue I didn't anticipate doing, but it actually worked out great. <laughs> um, and it ends up being, next slide, please. Because of that, due to that fact, I have made many collections in my repertoire on the Smithsonian Learning Lab due to the fact that I needed to make one every day. I made that commitment to my, my family and school community, and I think it worked out really well. I think it also became a place of 
my county started retweeting it for other schools for people to use. And so it ended up being more than what I anticipated, which was just the, the second graders who, I had, who had been waiting for me to do something about super, superheroes were excited, but it turned out to be great for lots of other people too. And I think that confidence of like, oh, I really can do this. People do value it and it is accessible led me um, to really thinking when we came back together, we're back into school, what does it look like now? So we're not in the pandemic setting of we're no longer meeting together. So what does it look like when we're finally back together planning? How do we merge what is virtual that was good and great and accessible for families and invitational and what we were doing before, which we also love. <laughs> Next slide, please. So what that kind of looks like is that there were plenty of virtual things that the Smithsonian was offering this year, and we signed up for a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually spent a good part of the year talking about which virtual experiences would work best in which units, which was really helpful because, um, for instance, we have a unit in fifth grade about the Smithsonian, um, that we use the Smithsonian Museum of the Native American, Na sorry, National Museum of the American Indian that has a one about Mayan um, numbers and they use that in, a, in a, a unit that we had. And so we were able to really work with lots of different and it reached out my teachers into thinking of a lot of other places. So we went beyond the Smithsonian, Wolf Trap, the Clean Project for Arts. So it really broadened teachers ideas of, so we're not stuck with the two museum trips that we're allowed to take, we can do a lot more in our own classrooms and give them a lot of ownership. Next slide, please. So I think my takeaway is to try things out, <laughs> to explore, um, to connect with people, because that really served me well. And I think the last thing that the takeaway for teachers, at least for me, is to ask for what you need. Like you don't know you have mm -hmm. that permission, but I feel like the Smithsonian really does ask for that, so. Well, thank you all so much. So that was, there were so many rich um, points of information and connection that were shared from each one of your presentations. I do also just want to invite um, the viewers to submit questions if you have questions, but I have a couple that I want to just tee up and, and jump into. Sorry, that's my, um, my phone. I apologize. So first off, um, I really, I really loved hearing about um, the innovation that happened during this period and, and how you were able to think about student needs, but then also your own personal professional development needs um, and really kind of progress in really meaningful ways. Um, Taylor, I wanna start off with something that you mentioned about the trans media approach that you um, kind of landed on in phase three. And Ellen and Taylor, I'd love to hear as Taylor describes this. So when you are thinking about transmedia, what, what are the actual forms that you're considering? Um, and then um, Ellen and Taylor, as you kind of are thinking about this and through your experiences, what have been most valuable in terms of the types of forms of, of digital access? Um, to start us off, it as an educator, I definitely have to think about the population of students that I'm teaching. Um, so some students uh, or some classes, they will be heavy with English language learners and maybe um, activities that are a little more hands-on with images or virtual labs where they can navigate step-by-step -step and kind of model um, processes that maybe they have not been exposed to. You know, I can be in a classroom where some students have used a microscope and some students haven't, or some students don't even know what a microscope does. So um, kind of using media where um, it could be pictures and then translate into um, <clears throat> virtual lab activities. So students are a little more um, confident. Uh, I think what we'll notice is what, a, what a, a teacher can really do is based on the confidence that their students have. And we really need to prepare them with that. And I like the, um, me personally, I like um, digital or, or transmedia where they can navigate through the process, model a lot of the thinking that is supposed to happen. Um, 
instead of just hearing me speak or I'm um, getting my perspective on something, um, really allowing students to be the, the lead in their, in their education. So I, I, I think the best things are virtual field trips, which have been mentioned, and then um, just the virtual lab platforms um, that can exist in many different, um, uh, you know, Smithsonian or um, Explore Learning, we have that. Um, a lot of those are, are good mediums that I like to employ in my classroom. So Taylor or Ellen, you want, I mean, I'm sorry, Ellen, or um, do you want to build on that? Or I mean, I think that one of the things when we are, we do look through the, the choices that we have when it comes to virtual field trips, but we also think about what maybe um, digital or virtual items or artifacts that we can look at that might be really important to revisit multiple times in a unit. Um, and those tend to be more slow looking experiences that the teachers and students take on uh, separate from the museum educators. And then sometimes it's because we wanna expose them to an idea or a person. So um, I'm thinking about a specific virtual field trip that we did through the portrait gallery around Pocahontas. And so the students really, when they reflected on the unit um, that at the end, they brought up that experience. So I do think it does stick with them, both the virtual items, but also the actual virtual programs that the museum curators are providing. Thanks. And, and Maggie, anything to add? Is, is this the direction your team is taking also or um, any reflections on what you heard? Yeah, it really is um, encouraging, I think, to hear this because um, for years we've been doing these teacher focus groups and trying to figure out exactly how to present this information to teachers. And we consistently hear that everybody's experience and needs are different. And so they don't need some kind of linear progression. They need to be able to have choice in how they put these things together. And so that really kind of is the underpinning foundation of our strategy to be able to bundle a lot of things that may have slightly different goals and uses in platforms together so that it gives teachers that choice. And I failed to mention this during my presentation, but we do align um, all of our live experiences and most of our asynchronous experiences with next generation science standards. That's something teachers told us hands down, we need to see the standards alignment to save us a little time. And so we usually really um, connect well with the cross cutting concepts there about kind of this cross disciplinary approach. Um, and also to Taylor's point earlier, um, trying to provide a couple different reading levels sometimes, even within our resources. So if you see literacy resources on some of our pages, it's actually like early readers and it'll actually be lexiled so that a teacher can say, oh, this is great for these students. Well, this one might be better for these. So we're trying to take that in so that we can kind of bake it into our approach. So my takeaway from that question is really that all forms are needed, right? <laughs> so I, I heard you talk about from, you know, if I'm putting this on a continuum, a picture, uh, but also heard conversations around virtual labs and virtual tours, um, museum tours. Um, I heard you talk about opportunities for students to self-navigate through activities and um, develop those skill sets. And so it really, it's not that we're saying there's a point on the continuum that's that's more valuable or less valuable. It really is the entire continuum. Um, and that there are, are different ways in which it makes it easier or um, been more helpful or um, for teachers to incorporate it into their daily practice. And that's actually a question that's come in from the audience. Um, they'd love to, to hear you guys talk about how do you actually select you know, because there's so much content, right? And Ellen, you were talking about how you're leveraging different um, different places. And so there's so much content. How do you actually select mm -hmm. what you will use and what you won't use? Well, um, <clears throat> I'll chime in. A lot of the selection, <clears throat> depending on where you teach, it could be uh, made for you. Um, so with the curriculum, it's, it's kind of like a pacing guide in some areas where um, we mentioned things like standards. So um, your curriculum has 
a, a flow of standards that you're supposed to hit at certain points. And it should model the progression of, of learning and how it builds on top of each other. Now, um, choosing a digital resource, uh, me personally, it's just like, man, I cannot present another reading to my students. <laughs> what can I do to make it fun? Um, and that's kind of how it starts for me. Um, but I, I know, um, or, or just trying to get students to m master a concept in different ways that, or in through different outcomes, you know, they can deliver a, an essay, but it could be more fun to learn the same concept through a virtual lab and then just answer or have a discussion about it. So it really depends on the standards that we're trying to do, um, whether they need to analyze, whether they need to discuss, whether they need to create. Now, when we get into creating things, it's gonna be a lot more fun because then we can bring out a, you know, a virtual lab experience or we can bring out a, a virtual field trip and um, have students in, engage to deepen their understanding. So that's really helpful. And, and Ellen, as I, I come to you and then Maggie, as you think about this also, um, so it, it, Taylor, what I heard you say is really that sometimes these decisions are made already. Um, and it, it really does have to connect to this, the scope and sequence, um, but you also are connecting to specific skills or standards. And that, that sometimes is the, the lens by which helps you to navigate um, all of the resources. Um, Ellen, I might, I might tweak this just a little bit for you and ask, um, as you come across resources, is there a structure that makes it easier? Like if, if a museum or a cultural center has like created as a lesson plan, or if it's just like an individual resource, or if, as Maggie said before, it's a resource with wraparound services, is there a type of format or way that it's packaged that makes it more, that makes it easier to utilize? I know what you're asking. I'm not sure necessarily that one is better than another, but I do, I do I feel a little bit like I am hunting and gathering quite a bit um, because the different depart obviously the different museums have different ways of, of reaching out and communicating. Some has, I mean, the Smithsonian Learning Lab is very easy in the fact that you can search something. I mean, it's almost like Google, you can write something and something is gonna pop up. <laughs> and so some pages though, um, like the Cooper Hewitt Museum, the Hirshhorn has like very specific, specific collections pre-made that teachers can kind of look through and sift through. And each of the museums also have that on their web websites too. But so it does become a little bit of some of the pre-work I have teachers do before we come together to meet. Like I, we're planning a, a unit around how we express ourselves in second grade, which is all about um, visual arts. And so I gave each teacher, well, here, look at the Smithsonian's, Hirsch, like, look at the Hirshhorn here. You look over at the National Gallery and each of you look at these collections and see, is there something, one of these collections you think the kids might really feel connected to, see themselves in the curriculum? Or will it bring out something, some deeper understanding that we're really looking for? Maybe it's that we want to highlight that women artists are also artists too, or a specific, maybe, I don't want to say nuance because it's not nuance, but something that is a little more, maybe not in the standards, but we know is important that mm -hmm. we want to bring through. And so I feel like the Smithsonian does have a pulse on that, like what they tweet about, um, the collections that they make. Are very responsive. I think it's just cataloging all of it. Yeah. Can be sometimes I end up sending myself whatever happens on Twitter to my email so I can say, oh, this would work great for fourth grade. Like Madeline Albright, the right. portrait gallery just put up the stuff about her. So I'm like, oh, this would go great in fifth grade's unit. So um, it is a bit of hunting and gathering. To it's get a hunting and gathering. So Maggie, for you, as you've been working with teachers and doing development, one of the things that I've heard come across from this conversation is confidence. Like um, that pivot point is when students feel like they have confidence in what they're doing, teachers feel like they have confidence in what they're doing. As you've been working with educators and in the development space, what are some of the things that you've noticed help to increase or build confidence for teachers as they are you know, gaining access, getting exposure, maybe participating in your wraparound services? What are some of the things that 
you notice have helped build and increase confidence? Um, using platforms, I think that they are used to has been the number one. Um, and so just staying on Zoom, they know Zoom, we're going to stay on Zoom, we're going to limit kind of the technology hurdles as much as we can, and use the tools within those spaces to be able to engage their students directly, but also taking kind of the leadership role in those synchronous experiences where in our digital school programs, we have a team of educators that they are really leading they are managing the technology the teachers have to get them to that space but we're doing um, all of that kind of facilitation and um, teaching in those moments and same with our webinars um, being able to get them there and then kind of take over though in the future i think as we're kind of continuing to build our capacity in this digital space that's definitely a gap that we see in what we're doing is that teacher professional development and that training and um that support role in terms of onboarding the technology the tools for both the teachers and then for them to be able to translate that into a training experience for their students Right. Okay, we're getting a lot of questions. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make a hard left turn uh, to a different topic. Okay. Uh, this question has come in, and there's an interest in knowing if if you have um, are there styles of digital interaction that you have found resonate more successfully with students, like augmented reality versus video or chat, etc. Um, <clears throat> it really, de it depends on the student. <clears throat> I love augmented reality. I used to do that a lot. Um, however, uh, some students have, you know, visual needs. I I'm also a special educator <laughs> in a past life. So um, students will have visual needs and using some of the technology or the impairment, they would be like, uh, I'm getting vertigo or something. So you, you also have to be mindful that or kids will just not want to do it you know, because they're, they're, they don't want to um, explore in, in that way. So there, there's always like a caveat. Um, sometimes I would design a lesson and I would think like this is, you know, this is foolproof, like nothing can go wrong. But with human nature, you know, that we, we can never think about it like that. Um, so yes, me personally, I love augmented reality. I would love to buy um, a bunch of uh, VR goggles and have students do um, anything on Smithsonian or even Google Expeditions um, that just to explore some of the topics. It, it, it creates this real world dynamic for students that makes learning mean, meaningful. And I think that's the overall goal. I, I think from an elementary perspective, one of the things that was the most popular, most successful, and the kids just really loved, um, when the Freer Sackler came and did um, a slow looking experience with our students and then combined that with yoga, we did it with both first and fourth graders. And because there was both a virtual component that was like very stationary and then a component that was connected, but also very physical, the students really liked the experience and wanted to do it every week. They were very disappointed to find out that it was a one and only kind of experience. But I do think there is something about combining both like the good things about being back together and then also the virtual elements that really free us from some of the things of not being able to physically go to the museum. So I think things that combine those in the elementary, at least, whether it's having discussions afterwards or whatever, it helps um, bridge the gap between where we were and where we are now. That's excellent. Maggie, anything you want to add there? Our, we have movement integrated in one of our K2 programs in the movement combination with that live interaction is really successful. And also for students who are um, able to write and read, uh, chat, it's the most basic technology, but the chat, being able to hear their name, see their voice and see their contributions in real time is really important, especially when it's held externally with a different kind of environment than they're used to. Okay. I think I only have time for one more question and I have like five questions that I want to ask. So um, I'm going to maybe try to merge two. Um, I, I would be uh, negligent if I didn't touch on the diversity, equity, inclusion, access points that you guys mentioned in your presentations. 
I heard a couple of things. One, diversity of content, so transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, but then also, Ellen, specifically, specifically from you, inclusion of voices that, you know, might have been left out from previous kind of instructional strategies or curriculum. Um, can you talk, like, give me two sentences on, do you think digital strategies um, are helping to enhance opportunities for um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and access? Absolutely. And I think it, what it gives us is, I think there are, they aren't in textbooks, they aren't in places. So having virtual artifacts, collections, and things are the perfect thing to um, bring to a classroom or to a group of teachers to so that they feel confident in talking about what's beyond um, a textbook or a standard. So yes, absolutely. Continue the wonderful work that the Smithsonian is doing in that. That's what I'll say about it. Yeah. And I'm actually getting the hook. So um, <laughs> Ellen, you have the last word on that. I just want to thank you all so much for the work that you're doing. It's so important. And, you know, thank you for helping to support students across the nation to really build up and lift up educators across the nation and just tremendous thank you and um, good luck with everything that you're continuing to do in the future. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.